well, thank you very much for joining me. And um, could you just start by introducing yourself and how you got involved with Chisholm Howe Dance Space? So um, my name's Elizabeth Lynch and I have worked as um, a director of organisations like ATM Arts, Tower Hamlet Summer University and um, Roundhouse Studios. And I've worked as a theatre practitioner, theatre director, directing community theatre shows in the UK and in India. And in 1982, I started working in Tower Hamlets and carried on working there until uh, about the year 2000. So in 1982, there was a very, um, and there still is a very thriving art scene in Tower Hamlets, which is in the East End of London, because the property was very cheap. The warehouses had not all been converted into luxury flats. And um, Chisenhale was one of those organisations that had relocated from Butler's Wharf, uh, which had been squatted uh, and is now, you know, luxury flats. I remember a couple of the people going and taking up the sprung floor that was at X6 and installing it in Chisenhale. So um, I, don't, I can't remember whether I knew any of the workers prior to coming to Tower Hamlets, but... You could travel around Tower Hamlets really quickly as well in those days because there wasn't all the traffic. So um, there was a very good arts um, department in the council. And I can't, anyway, they brought us together or we found each other very quickly because the people who wanted to work with young people and communities declared themselves quite readily. And the people that I worked with most were Mary Prestige, Phil Jack, Chris Cheek. Then there was... Um, various singers, Lol Cox used to appear from time to time at events, very famous saxophonist, uh, Jan Howarth I remember, and there are probably others, um, people who I think were, well some of them were starting out in their careers, others, others like um, Mary, had, you know she'd been an Olympic gymnast, she was quite key because a lot of the young people that we were working with had no experience of dance. Maybe they had done some Irish dancing or they'd been drum majorette. It was great to work with them because we worked in an interdisciplinary way with our events at the A team because we wanted to find engagement points for as many young people as possible when we were invited into um, work with a youth club or a series of youth organisations. So there were always performing arts elements such as drama, dance and music and then very strong visual arts elements for those young people who didn't want to perform, but like making. So we would have spectacular costumes. We would dress the space. We'd use video and project, you know, slide projections, whatever the technology was at the time. We would, um, we were early adopters. We would use it to transform spaces. But a lot of the work was out on the street because it was a good space to bring people together. Who, who would not go into the theatre or into performance spaces. And it was a very good way to bring the different communities together because often the organisations were in ethnic silos. You know, you'd have Bangladeshi groups and then you would get more mixing with the um, West Indian heritage and, heritage and, and white um, communities. But bringing people together through a, an arts event was a really useful way of doing it and in... I suppose, liminal outdoor spaces, spaces that weren't owned by anybody, but could be owned by everybody. We enjoyed the fact that we were making public statements with young people going out on the streets and owning the streets and saying, we're here and we're creative and we make beautiful things. And of course, when that happened, um, people on the local estates and their parents were always involved because they had to be. And yeah, and food was usually part of it as well. Somewhere on the line, we could fix it. So, you know, all the principles of good community arts, participatory arts practice. So Mary, because she worked as a gymnast and because Chisholm ethos was very much about experimenting with dance, but also making dance more democratic and uh, challenging perceptions of, of what dance could be. She was a great person to work with our young people because she would work with what they had and build on it. But also, um, you know, because it was experimental work, you could try things out. And because we were working often with quite large groups of people and because we were working visually and with music, you could make quite bold statements. And of course, 
reflecting those back to the participants, they often were astonished at what they'd done because when it all came together, it was like, oh, wow, you know, um, and these young people were all coming to work with us in their own time. We weren't working in schools. We were working in youth clubs and community organisations. We did have some specialist theatre groups and occasionally dance groups for young people who wanted to continue working with us. So that was always good because then you had a sort of hardcore of young people who wanted to take their performing skills a bit further. We'd use things that were already in the, you know, in the zeitgeist, like Guy Fawkes, May Day, in order yeah. to maximise that, but then try and do things with a twist that were different. So I think AT Marks was set up in 1979 by, under the ILEA, which is in an education authority. And we had a lot of... Um, independence you know we had our own bank account you know it was very different in those days when the IDA was disbanded by Margaret Thatcher and we became part of the borough that was trickier in a sense I mean that's when the funding started to fade away from these events towards the late 80s because Thatcher's cuts came into effect but we did have that security of being a local authority funded organization and we did have those relationships because we were there all year round. And we, as well as the big sort of, you know, May Day, Christmas, whatever, we were doing smaller projects, smaller interventions and building those relationships all the time because we were part of the youth service and we were being invited into youth clubs to do short-term projects usually, either intensively over a school holiday or on a weekly basis over a term. So we were a great resource for organisations like Chisholm who weren't doing constant work with young people, but we, were, we gave them access and we were trusted because we used to do lots of repeat visits and we worked with youth workers who in turn were doing that grassroots relationship building. You know, it was a layer of trust and relationships that so was easy for us to go on to an estate in Bow and work in a youth club or a community organisation there because the youth workers had prepared the ground. So we would turn up and with our van and everything and our materials, but they were encouraging the children and the parents to say, this is a good thing. And it was usually, there was always a bespoke element for them. So if we were either doing something very specific for that organisation, or we were saying, we're working with six organisations to do this big event and you're all going to come together. But then the youth workers would all know each other as well. And, you know, so it was, an, it was an, a network that was iterative and built up over many years. Now, some of the things I don't think, I'm trying to think if Chisholm Hell was involved in this, but for example, we did a lot of work uh, around Cannon Street Road um, with Bangladeshi organisations. They were processions, and at the time, I think we did the first one in 1982 or three, there's a lot of National Front activity, and we did these very splendid, um, colourful processions with um, a sort of Bangladeshi theme. And I remember Mark going along Cable Street, we'd have musicians. It's probably likely that maybe there were some musicians from Chisholm Hill, I can't remember, but we were making a big statement and then there were these skinheads outside a pub on Cable Street and they were um, shouting out racist things. And I mean, we have teenage boys with us and everything, but there wasn't, you know, we just, our response was that we're here and we're fabulous and you can get lost because we're, this is our space. Because there was a time when, the, that was the time in the early eighties when the National Front had a presence um, in Bethnal Green when they used to sell puppies, but they would hand out their, um, National Front uh, newspaper and the Anti-Nazi League would be, you know, protesting against them. So, you know, politically, it felt the outdoor work felt very charged at the time. And that event that you, you sent me, the, the scan of the book, I mean, that was an anti-nuclear circus. And that was very much still a politics of the time that was a sort of, but you have to do it in a sort of, particular way that it was accessible to young people. I think there's talk, there's talk of the, the impact on the environment and the bees and everything. I can't remember now in that booklet. And then later we did a whole thing in Victoria Park where we had a giant Mrs. Thatcher puppet and a giant Ronald Reagan puppet and we burnt them at the end. <laughs> 
we wouldn't be allowed to do that now. I mean, no. The council would go bonkers. Yeah. You know, I mean, that was probably 1984. So it's it's wow. super interesting how times have changed yeah. um, about what you're allowed to do and what you're not allowed to do. So because we, you know, we were working with these groups, it was a great way for artists who were more sort of veering on the whole towards working in their own practice. If they wanted to engage with the community, then we were good allies and good partners. The work that you were doing was obviously really political. At times, yeah. And one of my questions was, you know, why was this work important? And I can see, or, you know, you've sort of already answered that, why it was important. I wonder if you've got anything else to kind of add, because, you know, you have a background in theatre. Mm-hmm. Um, obviously, there was Chisholm Dance Space, which was experimental dance kind of broadening out into performance and live art but the work that 18 was doing even though it was interdisciplinary you know you had the paintings and and kind of set designs and things like that as well it was grounded if if I'm right in saying in in those kind of live acts in those like live (laughs) moments um why do you think that liveness was doing working in that way with with theatre and dance and performance why was that important for that work? The work that um, I was doing with my colleague, first Amanda Webb and then um, Geraldine Bone, and they, they, we had a big pool of freelance artists who we could pay to work with us. So, oh, yeah. you know, we just employ them. They didn't have to sort of join a pool officially, which meant we had lots of flexibility so we could get the right artist and often a state of the art artist to work with us, you know. But the artists that we, most of the artists we were working with, and certainly ourselves, we had our practice, that we never used to call it that, had um, emerged from the sort of counterculture of the late 60s and 70s. And when we were at university, we were very influenced by um, Albert Hunt and Welfare State and people like that who'd gone before us and were making art in non-theatre spaces, in non-gallery spaces, and with the people. But I think we were post working with the people in that kind of bringing culture to people because, um, you know, we realized that that was, um, you know, patronizing. And so we kind of been through all that, seen all that and thought, no, that's not the way to go. But I think where we were coming from was that we really felt it was important that young people had the opportunity to be creative, to learn creative skills and to try things out, but also to be visible in their communities when children as ever are are not valued as people who contribute as young citizens to the life of their community. And also how powerful they are to bring people together when you have a community that's often fragmented. You know, there was a a lot of racism in the East End at the time and um, you had to, you know, constantly work to, to challenge that, but also not slap people down you know, challenge it and bring them together and move them on because otherwise you'd never you'd never work on the Isle of Dogs, for example. You know? Well, you would, but I mean, there was a lot of um, anti Bangladeshi feeling. You know, and a lot of it was aggravated by poor, I, I think, political and administrative um, issues of the local authority and housing, where it wasn't clear about how housing was allocated. It was difficult. Um, so we were making some very ideological decisions about how we would work. But also we knew because we were not working in schools, we had more freedom, but also the work had to be really engaging because young people could choose to participate or not. You know, they didn't have, we always made sure we had a space so that people who didn't want, you know, you had to make a conscious choice to join or try it out and then you could leave, you know, you didn't have to stay. So that sort of thinking about how to really work, make the work really engaging, but also to have a, a bigger vision um, and to think about something to aim for so that the young people and their parents and the youth workers could be inspired. You know, people talk a lot about co-creation these days. I think in those days we didn't use that term, but I think it's fair to say that we would go in as artists because of the timescales, we would have the vision for what the thing could be and some, you know, milestones like a giant puppet or, you know, it would be a mixture of 
a bit like carnival. These are the designs and this is how you do them and we're sharing new skills. But there would also be the element of, you know, this is the framework and you can, within that framework, you will express yourself creatively once we've taught you these skills. And, you know, the framework, this is the story, but how it's going to be told will be down, we'll co-create it with you. So it was a mixture. I mean, a lot, some colleagues were working, um, you know, develop, I mean, there wasn't much written at the time, you know, academic work. So some, but some colleagues were writing and were very political and were, were sort of um, uh, writing about the framework of community art. I'm sure Chisinau had a more academic art history or dance history framework behind them. But the, for the, in the, on the theatre side, it all felt very new still. There wasn't much written and people were trying things out and we knew about welfare state and free form. I did one of the first welfare state summer schools. I was very influenced by them, the giant puppets, the, um, the poetry, um, the multimedia, the story. But a lot of their work, you know, was, I mean, they sort of designed it all and then got people to do it. I think working with young people, we had to involve them more because the ownership was very important and it needed to be authentic, you know, for the children we were working with because you can't work any other way, really. I mean, you really have to work with young people in that kind of flexible way. It was community arts. Some people were very sneery about that, and that's valid sometimes, but you could say that about mainstream arts, that the quality or the rigor wasn't there. And then Thatcher shifted the community arts. I think that it went to participatory, which was much more individualistic, if you like. I mean, Francois Matarasso has written about this. He's written a very good essay, and then he sort of says participatory was about individuals joining rather than communities. And then socially mm -hmm. engaged practice became the sort of... So I, I, I tend to avoid using that term socially engaged mm -hmm. um, because I don't really feel that that's um, what we were doing. You know, mm -hmm. I think it was a mixture of the sort of community arts and participation because you know block participatory practice is really good as well mm. I mean in terms of working with individuals who need that kind of approach um, and on the whole the the council the Tower Hamlets council then must have been very supportive of the work that you were they, doing they were and then in later years after I'd left and my colleague Geraldine was still in post the, the latest iteration of the council, they wanted to make cuts and they made lots of cuts in the youth service. But the first time they tried to make cuts, young people went up to the town hall and lobbied the mayor and said, you can't cut the 18, it means too much to us. And so that was very political and they didn't get cut. And then a couple of years ago, they finally did say we're going to, in so many words, going to axe the 18. This is like, 44 years, you know, it's sort of been going all this time. Um, but then, because in a big part of their work in later years was working with young Bangladeshi people and fashion and getting them into London College of Fashion and things like that, um, Alexander McQueen's charity, have, we have been working with them and they have stepped in and they haven't taken over the theatre and music side, but they, they've we continue at the same premises. They're paying the rent, they're paying the staff. They've set up, you know, my former director colleague is now a director of the charity. So Alexander McQueen's charity is interesting. Bungie, and it's still called 18 Lots. So that shows you the depths of, um, and because a lot of the councillors have been youth workers, Bangladeshi councillors have been youth workers, they've grown up. So they were always. Um, you know, that was a good, they'd had the experience and it was part of their teenage years or young adulthood being part of an A-team event. So they were always very, and because of the quality, they always want to cut the arts, they always want to cut youth. It's not getting bigger, it's always getting smaller. Yeah. So, um, and, and I think the continuity of the staff, so I worked there a long time and then my deputy director became the director and you know, when we were taking maternity leave, we felt we couldn't take too long. I mean, it's terrible when I think about it because they would cut the post. Mm. So we came back after what five months, you know, because we thought, oh God, if we stay off too long, they'll, they'll cut the post and there'll only be one of us. And, you know, so, wow. yeah. yeah, I don't know, yeah. It, was, it was, yeah, the, the commitment of the staff and people to the project and the work 
has been significant in the project's longevity and survival. Mm. And I'm sure that's true with Chisenham as well. Yeah, yeah, I think I think it is. And I think, you know, for any of those kind of organisations like Chisenham and, and kind of similarly to A-Team as well, that are really driven by um, people wanting to do that work, having those people in there keeps it going yes. and, and, and makes it what it is. I suppose the big thing about the East End, Hackney and Tower Hamlets, not so much Newham, was the cheap property. Also, you know, you could live, you could live there, not just have a workshop there. So lots of artists. At one point, the one, the highest concentration in Europe of artists living on the Isle of Dogs mm. before it was redeveloped. Can you yeah. imagine? That in itself was significant. Yeah. And because Tower Hamlets has got this history of activism because lots of you know there were lots of um like oxford house you know the universities came and they had settlements and there was toynbee hall you know people doing good works or radicals you know the labor movement annie besant you know they'd all done stuff in the east end so there was this activist unity history and a lot of the youth workers like dan jones who worked in the print shop they were activists um, very political so yeah it felt like a very vibrant and exciting place to be because of the talent that was there the, the sort of um, the, the, the social workers the church you know there weren't there were nuns who were very active and they weren't trying to be um, convert people but in the Catholic Church and in the um, Church of England you know they were very activist with their community mm -hmm. so that all you know we all hooked up and worked together because could yeah mm -hmm. um okay so my last question then um if you had to describe what chisholm hell was at that time in the 80s how would you describe it so um open-minded uh experimental you know it was great to have a an, an ally that was experimental um adventurous pioneering um well for us it was very it was a very accessible space it didn't feel austere it was a very clean pure space you know but it didn't have the austerity of the Whitechapel gallery for example because it was yeah. right around the edges and so on yeah thank you very much for talking to me